My name is Anna, and I attend Celebrate Recovery at Ken Island United Methodist Church. And you came here to share a story with us today? Yes, I came to share my testimony. Great. Would you like to share that with us now? Sure. So um, I began my drug addiction at a very young age. I started using when I was 13, and I started using harder drugs whenever um, I was around 15. Um, I became addicted to heroin very early in my using stages, and um, I used to alter high school, and there were little to no consequences when I began using. Um, I was able to still go to school. Um, mostly we're just using on the weekends for fun, and um, you know, there was really no reason at that point in time that I felt like I needed to stop. After I went to school, I graduated, and when school was over, I began, went right into work, um, had a full-time job. My drug addiction continued, and um, I continued to use more and need more because of my tolerance. So I was spending every dollar I made on my paycheck on heroin, and I needed more money. So I never had enough money. Um, so one of the first things that I did in my addiction that looking back was um, hard to believe that I did, but it became natural and it became easy was started stealing from my family, um, whether it be stealing from pocketbooks or stealing items that I could take to the pawn shop. Um, that's where it began with me to be able to use my addiction when I didn't have enough money. And then I continued to use, um, then I began shoplifting in stores. I didn't get caught for a long time. Um, eventually I did get caught. When I got caught, I just was given a slap on the wrist and wasn't taken to jail or anything. And I had stole hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of merchandise. Um, so I really didn't learn anything from that consequence. It was like a bump in the road. I know that my family started noticing that I, I was different, that I was isolating, I wasn't coming around them. When I was coming around them, I would come around them high. They would ask me if I was using, I would deny it, of course, and that was pretty much the end of the conversation in my home. So at that point in time in my addiction, I just didn't go around people that loved me enough to pull me up on what was going on. I stayed with people that got high, people that used drugs. Um, because they allowed me to be who I was at that moment in time. So as a result of staying around many people that were using, I seen people that were way worse off than me. Um, you know, they had started using the needle. Um, you know, it was just, I, I seen pregnant women using. Um, I seen friends of mine that I had began using with, you know, prostituting in Baltimore, um, beautiful girls that you would never think they'd be walking up and down the streets doing that to feed their addiction. And I was able to look at them and say, I'm not that bad. You know, I, I'm not prostituting. I'm, you know, not doing some of the other things that they were doing. And it just kept me in my addiction longer. Little did I know that um, in a very short time, I would be doing everything that I said I wouldn't be doing. And I would be doing most of what all those other people were doing. And that's when I really realized how quickly I went down a downward spiral through my addiction and how quickly I lost control. Uh, for a long time, I felt like I had control. Um, and, you know, I had no control. I had to use every day. And the times in my life where I thought I could quit using, um, I would say, I'm just going to use on the weekends. I'm only going to use this drug, or I'm only going to use a certain amount of money. And every single thing I tried never worked. Um, I always ended up doing the same thing every day, using the same amounts, getting the same drugs. Um, so when I finally realized that something bad was going to happen to me because I had a fear, I had already robbed drug dealers. They were after me. I had already really burned bridges with my friends. Um, they, my friends were after me, and I just had a fear that I carried around with me. Um, and I knew that something bad was going to happen. I never asked for help. I never went to my family at that point in time. I never thought, you know, I don't have to live this way anymore. I think 
addiction is so powerful and the disease of addiction is so powerful that it just wouldn't allow me to think that far into anything. I just was so programmed every day to think robotically in regards to feeding my addiction and getting heroin. And um, so I decided in the midst of all that to ask for help. And I went to my family and I sat down and told them that I was a heroin addict and I needed help. Um, unfortunately, my family wasn't sure what to do with me. You know, at that point in time, we really didn't even wrap our head around that there was a rehab, um, that there was another way to live. We just knew that I needed to sit still and not keep doing what I was doing. And so my family asked me to not go anywhere, to not hang out with the bad people, to kind of stay home while we wrapped our head around, you know, what to do next. And um, I, one of the most important things that I remember from this point in time is how relieved I was that I told somebody. I told somebody that was in a position to help me. I told somebody that loved me, was able to, you know, hold me accountable at that point in time, which is what I really needed. And the next day my parents asked me to not um, go anywhere. You know, they both went to work. And I was just so relieved that I did. I woke up and I felt freedom. Um, I felt like a million bricks had been lifted off my back. I decided I wasn't going to go anywhere. I was going to stay home. And um, then withdrawal started kicking in. And, you know, as time passed, they got worse and worse. And I called my mom and I told her, you know, I'm awake. You know, I felt good at first, but I'm not feeling good right now. I'm feeling pretty bad and I want to go get high. And my mom asked me, um, you know, this is just a desperate position that a mother would be in. Um, she asked me if I'd ever went to the emergency room and I had not, you know, I hadn't did anything at that point in time to get help. I didn't even know what help looked like. And so I decided I was going to go to the emergency room. And the amazing thing about this part of my story is that that showed my willingness. You know, I was willing. I hadn't tried something. At the end, I didn't have money. I didn't have gas in my car. I was only able to get from point A to point B. And usually point A was wherever I was and point B was getting dope. So I was willing to go to the emergency room. And um, that was a big deal. However, I got there and I was told that I couldn't be helped. Um, I was told that there was a methadone clinic down the street and that if I wanted help, I should go there. And at that point in time in my using, I had used with many people that were on methadone. And, um, you know, they, their drug addiction didn't change. You know, they didn't get jobs. Um, they used more drugs. So I decided that I wasn't going to go to the methadone clinic. And I ended up leaving the hospital and going and getting heroin. And um, I didn't make it home, you know. My mom didn't have a way to find out where I was and who I was with. And uh, I ended up with some drug dealers in Baltimore City. And uh, we got a lot of drugs. And we were coming back to Cecil County to sell them. And at that point in time, that's how I fed my addiction, was running my car out to drug dealers and doing whatever they needed me to do. And some pretty sick stuff. Um, went on in that, that environment. But so I came back to Cecil County and I sold, you know, a couple hundred dollars worth of dope for these people and they paid me in heroin. And once I got my payment, I was leaving happily, ready to get away from them. And um, they pulled me aside. You know, they beat on my car as I was pulling out and said, you know, can you take us to make another sale? And rather than saying no, I knew I was going to get more dope for doing it. So I decided to, to take them, and we called the house on our way there. We told them we were coming to drop something off, and um, they were waiting for us and expecting us. We pulled up. I'd been to this house hundreds of times. Um, it was a very, um, you know, place you go to use drugs where I was from. And I pulled up. They told me to leave my car running and turn my lights out, which I did. And then I seen uh, two guys coming up towards me and one guy had a gun and um, the other guy ran past my car and the guy that had the gun um, he was saying stop stop and of course you know I seen a guy running towards me with a gun I went to go take off and when I did he um, ended up on the hood of my car and you know he's continually telling me to stop and I'm gunning it at this point in time and as a 
result of doing so, he kind of rolled off the hood of my car. And um, before he did so, he fired his gun and the bullet went through my windshield, hit my steering wheel, went to my ear. And so I realized that I had been shot and um, that's actually, I slammed on my brakes at that moment in time and he rolled off the hood of my car. And then I kept going. And as I was driving away, um, I just heard gun gunshot after gunshot. Um, all the bullets were hitting my car. I didn't know where they were coming from. I didn't know who was firing them. I was driving a convertible at the time. So I was pretty much in fear that a bullet would probably hit me in the head as I was driving. Um, so I went to the end of the road and I just sat there for a moment. The bullets had stopped coming and I was away from the scene and I just sat there thinking, you know, what just happened, you know? Um, you know, why, why is this happening? Um, and then I realized, you know, I needed to go get help. And so I went to a store that was close by and when I was at the store, I remember I just got given, you know, dope for helping these guys out and I had my whole kid and I lived for heroin at that moment in time and I just remember thinking, you know, what do I do with all this stuff? Because my thinking was so messed up that I thought I was going to go in that store and, you know, they'd wrap my ear up or they'd put a band-aid on me and I'd be back out and I could go back at it again and, you know, that just wasn't reality. But that's where my thinking was and so I remember thinking, should I hide this stuff in a dumpster? Should I hide it in the trash can? And just, you know, throwing my hands up and just saying, I don't care and leaving it there and going inside to get help and, you know, um, I got help. Um, there was a nurse there at that moment in time and uh, she asked me, was I an IV drug user? And I was. Um, I had been using the needle for probably about a year at that point in time. And, um, you know, I was just disgusting. At the end of the end for me, I just didn't care anymore. I didn't care about showering. I didn't care about, um, I didn't care about anything. You know, nothing was important. And, um, you know, this woman just took me in her lap and she just held bandages to my ear and she told me everything was going to be all right. And um, just amazing because I was a mess. Like, I'm not sure I would have wanted to even touch somebody that looked like me. Um, so the cops come, the cops are there to help, you know, and I tell them where to go, where to get the bad guys because I assumed that I was being robbed. And the cops come back and tell me, you know, Miss Fox, nobody was trying to rob you. Nobody was trying to steal your car. Um, they said, you're coming with us on a Maryland State Trooper helicopter. You just ran over a Maryland State Trooper. And so, um, you know, at the time I didn't realize that was what was happening. Um, the guy, I couldn't tell that he was a police officer. And, um, you know, I ended up going to shock trauma. Um, there was an officer there that had a daughter my age. He asked me several times if he could call my parents and notify them of what happened. And I did not want my parents to know. I didn't want them to get that phone call that pretty much they'd probably waited for for many years. And um, I just remember telling him, you know, stop asking me. I'm not going to change my mind. I don't want my parents to get woke up and find this out because it was three or four o'clock in the morning. And I remember um, telling him, I just told them I'm a heroin addict three days ago. I just told them, they told me not to leave. They told me to stay home and I didn't, you know, I went back out and to get one more and this is what happened to me and please leave my parents out of it. And they ended up, he ended up asking me so many times, even after that, that I said, fine, call my parents, you know? And so I listened to this guy call my mom, you know, four o'clock in the morning and I heard her on the other end. I heard, you know, what they told her, what happened just, you know, never understanding from a parent's point of view what that would be like. Um, but so I ended up going to jail, ended up staying in jail. My parents were relieved that I was in a safe place. They knew where I was. They knew I was safe. Um, I kicked and screamed and threatened to get out because heroin was so loud. When I was in there, I didn't want to sit still. I didn't want to get clean. I wanted to get high so bad. You know, I wanted out. I tried everything to get out. And, um, I ended up staying there for six months. And after the six months, I didn't want to leave. I was scared. I knew what was waiting outside. I knew what I was capable of. I knew if I put something into me, it was going to be game on. And um, 
you know, I ended up leaving jail and ended up getting high again. And um, eventually I checked into rehab and that was 13 years ago. Um, I don't have 13 years clean. Um, I have 12 years. I used a couple times. Um, you know, I had a couple relapses, but pretty much desperation is a gift for me. And, um, you know, going to those places in my addiction where I've been, um, knowing, you know, the phone call my mom get that the next one could be that I'm found dead somewhere. I just don't want to put her through that. Um, knowing that I have a life today, that I'm free, that I'm happy and I'm joyful, um, that I have a powerful message and a powerful story that can help many other people know that, you know, if I can get clean, anybody can get clean. Um, you know, allowing parents to know that at your worst, you know, there's still hope. Um, if your child's breathing, there's hope, you know. Um, my parents, you know, they've been here through me throughout. Um, Celebrate Recovery has been amazing. I have the most wonderful women in my life. I didn't trust women. Uh, women were my enemy out on the streets. You know, we were both trying to fight and stomp for the same things, and um, I'm past all that. You know, I just am surrounded by the most amazing women that I trust. Uh, I trust them with my life. I trust them with everything. Um, a lot of the things that triggered me to start using um, were as a result of things I'd been through as a child, and through recovery, I've been able to work through all those issues. Um, I've been able to accept circumstances and things that happen that can't be changed. I've been able to forgive my parents. And um, in doing so, it just lifts so much weight off of me that I carried around for most of my life. So, um, yeah, being clean is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Okay. And if there's anything that you don't want to answer or don't feel comfortable answering, just you can say skip and we won't even include it in the interview. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. You had, you had stated earlier in your story that uh, you just basically got a slap on the wrist the first time that you were caught. Yeah. Do you wish that the consequences at that point were worse? And if so, do you, do you wish that there were worse consequences now? Yeah, so I got caught shoplifting in Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was actually Baltimore County but I would have been sent to central booking had I been arrested. And, you know, I do. I wish I would have been sent to central booking. Um, I've heard horrible stories about that place. And I think being there might have opened my eyes to some of the things I would have seen. Um, being totally powerless in a situation would have been a wake-up call, possibly. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I got several slaps on the wrist that I think if they went the other way, I could have possibly been shaken straight sooner. Right. How old were you at that point? So at that point in time, I was probably about 20 years old. Okay. Yeah. So it had been about five years. Yeah. So you, you start as a child, and there are a lot of people out there who don't really realize how young people are starting. And a lot of parents, especially in the community, say, not my child. And we even have the not my child event. Mm -hmm. What would you say to parents who have that mentality, not my child? Yes, I mean, I would just say that, you know, be true to yourself. Um, as a parent, you know your child better than anyone, and you know the signs and the symptoms to look for. You would know if your child starts isolating in their room, if they start locking the door, if, um, you know, they start hanging around with different people. I mean, even to say the bad crowd, you know. There's a bad crowd of people that, you know, students and you can kind of get sucked into. And those are all red flags too, you know, that your child could be up to no good or doing things that um, result in using drugs. Mm -hmm. You said that uh, when you'd stopped, obviously you were going through withdrawals. And a lot of people always say, just stop. Why can't you just quit? Are you able to even begin to explain what it's like to experience withdrawal? Like what, what is that pain? So, um, withdrawals. A lot of people don't stop because of withdrawals. Um, pretty much from my experience and the experience of many people that I know, you need to be put into a controlled environment. You need to be detained. You need to be uh, monitored 
by staff, nurse, doctors, um, you know, like a rehab or a jail in my situation where I ended up going and withdrawal as well. Um, so withdrawals are physically, um, you have no energy. You're just, you can't move. It, it's like you can't get out of bed, you can't do anything. Um, a lot of times when I was using, I would be so lethargic and just couldn't do anything. But when I knew I got enough money to go get something, you know, I got enough energy to get up and go get it. Mm -hmm. And then I used that energy to get it. And then once I got it, it was just like, I was brought back to life, game on, run, run, run. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but um, something that's important to focus on with heroin and opiate, you know, addiction is, the psychological part, you know, mentally, you are, you withdraw mentally as well, because mentally you're thinking about it every minute of the day. You're thinking about it when you don't have it, when you have it, you're already thinking about the next one. It's just the most powerful mental addiction that I've ever faced, and I have a hard time explaining it, but for me, um, you know, I can remember the physical part was, you know, tormenting, but I remember the mental obsession was the worst part of my heroin addiction. Mentally, just every second of the day I was a slave to it. It was, it's unexplainable. Yeah. And that's where I have that compassion, knowing those people that are caught up in the grip, knowing the people in our community that are strung out on heroin or strung out on opiate pills. I know that how tough that is. I know how they can go somewhere, you know, they can think they're staying home. Like my parents thought, oh, let's keep her home for a couple of days, you know, get it out of her system, wake up and she'll be fine, which, you know, maybe I could have got it out of my system that way. But the mental obsession is what I would have never sat through, you know, mentally, I just wouldn't have been able to do it. So that's why rehab and jail are so important to right. just get out of your environment, sit still, be kind of forced into something that's very hard to do on your own. Right. And now that you're in recovery, mm -hmm. you're constantly healing. Yeah. And work in healing, progress. Right. And you're healing physically and mentally. But I was wondering, did you ever get a chance to heal socially in a way that did you ever get a chance to talk to the police officer? Yeah. So um, one amazing thing about my story in regards to the police officer is um, this event, you know, this horrible, tragic event happened in Cecil County. So when I got clean, I came to Queen Anne's County. I started a new life here. This is my recovered life. Um, I never went back home. It was a decision that I made that I think allowed me to still be clean today. Um, but so the officer that night that ended up shooting me and you know was, was involved in the shooting incident, he was um, in Queen Anne's County and he had later became the commander of the Centerville barracks, the state police barracks. Um, our county had been in an epidemic at that point in time, many years before Queen Anne's County. So they needed to use other resources from other counties to help combat what was going on there. He was called in from here. So I would have, or could have seen him, bumped into him anywhere and would not have known it. Um, I had a very long court ordeal with the situation. And when I was in court, I didn't look at him. Um, I hadn't did a lot of work on myself at that point in time to get through mm -hmm. forgiving. You know, I had a little bit of blame issues. Um, however, he contacted me. I was sharing my story. I had many opportunities to go um, share with youth, which is what I'm very passionate about. And he had heard, you know, my name. He heard what I was doing. I went to the courthouse, actually, and that's where he heard. Um, and he contacted me and said, you know, we are in an epidemic. And us together would be a good team to share what we've been through and share with others that, you know, hope is possible, recovery is possible. That's amazing. I know you guys have spoken at events. Yes. And there, there are events going on in the area and lots in different counties and stuff's always happening. But, and this is the last question, what would you like to see happen next to help the community? So, you know, since I'm along, time person in recovery. I get the opportunity to help a lot of people that, you know, they're on the streets right now. They're in, they're, they're in the war zone, you know, they're, they're, they gotta have it. They're strung out. Um, you know, the hardest thing that I'm still going through helping these people that are in the war zone is getting them into treatment. 
you know, it still takes days, you know, weeks to get somebody into treatment and treatment is vital. You know, that window of opportunity is so small when an addict in addiction is ready to get help. They need to get help immediately. You know, they can change their mind and go back out and not make it back, you know? I mean, they could overdose and die. They could go get a new charge and end up in jail for 10 years. Um, so I think right now, I would love to see more opportunities for people that when they're ready, help is on the way. You know, in Anne Arundel County, they have where if you're an Anne Arundel County resident, you can go to a fire station and you're guaranteed to get help and you're guaranteed to get into a treatment center immediately. Mm -hmm. And you know, here, we don't have that. You know, I think people, if we are in an epidemic and we are doing everything we can to help people, people should have that opportunity to go to a safe place, ask for help, and immediately get the help that they need. There shouldn't be a time frame of days and weeks waiting for that to happen, not in the middle of an epidemic. Right. And um, it's been very frustrating. I've tried to help many, many people. And I've had people tell me I'm going to die. If I go back out, I'm going to die. I can't use another night. I'm going to die. And I can't do anything for these people. You know, they need help then, and I can't give it to them. Right. So. Well, hopefully something can be done. And hopefully you come in and sharing your message will hopefully spur more action for more people. I hope so. So thank you for coming in. Thank you. And sharing your story. Thanks for having me. Of course.